Water is the commons of all living things. Certainly in the last 150, 160 years, we think about water as a commodity that we can export from one place and then distribute as a right of our citizenship. But there's much older and earlier ways to think about water as commons for all living things, and that we all need to ask permission, honor the water. Almost every culture has that deeply embedded into it. Most people that I would talk to who live here in Los Angeles have absolutely no idea where their water came from, let alone that we were approaching a big anniversary. So the question of how do you celebrate something that nobody knows exists became perplexing to me. The real way to commemorate something is to offer a solution.
One of the things that the Owens Valley has paid dearly for as a result of our lifestyle is the agri-potential of the Owens Valley has consistently shrunk over time because it requires a lot of water to have an agricultural livelihood. So how do we say that those people in the Owens Valley deserve some of the benefits of urbanity since they are paying a lot of the cost? And one of the ways that we can do that is to make sure that we pay attention to what their needs are. So the metabolic studio's engagement in the Owens Valley has involved soil production. We work with a network of growers to turn compost into soil by adding carbons that come from the mule packing industry, which is a very active tourist element still working in the Owens Valley. The mules were used to build the aqueduct in the first place, and they were used at that same time by Teddy Roosevelt to build the Panama Canal. They're a major, major labor force in the construction of the Western world as we know it. And in the United States, they have never properly been acknowledged for their role in the construction of agriculture. It was in that collaboration with the mule packers that I met up there that I realized that there was potential to walk the entire Los Angeles aqueduct as a commemorative action for the centenary of the opening of the LA aqueduct. I wanted to draw the line for people between the source of our water and the city that benefits to actually be that line, not metaphorically, but to literally choose 100 mules moving continuously for a month, like an animated drawing. And in that process, to learn ourselves how to live off the grid. Walking the aqueduct is about the mystery of the mule, the first hybrid animal ever produced on the planet, the first slave. We created the mule to do our work 2,000 years ago. It's the first invention to shape the world in our dreams of it.
So the route that we walked is bookended by two symbolic pieces of engineering. The intake of the LA Aqueduct, which is just north of Jen and Lee Rozier's ranch in Independence, and the Cascades in Silmar, when the water that's been imported from the Owens Valley is first released into the city. So those symbolic nodes are the beginning and the ending of the route. Along that journey, there's sort of three distinct sections. The first section is right in the foothills of the Eastern Sierras where the water comes from. And it was mostly open canals. To move 100 mules for 240 miles involves an incredibly organized, movable urban form. We had five portable corrals that got set up and broken down every day, packed into two trucks. We had a kitchen truck with a crew of three or four people that would make two meals a day, breakfast and dinner. We would carry sandwiches with us on the road. We didn't stop for lunch. So to move the mules requires that the mules be split up into groups of 10. They're called strings. Each string of 10 mules has a wrangler that's dedicated to it. So for 100 mules, there were 10 wranglers with three extra wranglers. We're kind of just taking the safe route, breaking, it, breaking down the strings and making it simple. Don't want to get wet today. <laughs> what do you want to do here, Jennifer? We're going to dismount the riders. They've got a ride right over there. We'll just take these mules across. We've got to wait for CHP anyway. We had a water truck that had toilets and showers that went with us on the road. We had a vet and a mule chiropractor who worked on mules every day once they got back that needed some adjustments. We hauled food for the mules and water for the mules. So it was a considerable logistic exercise.
100 mules walking the Los Angeles aqueduct would have remained a dream without the assistance of Jen and Lee Rozier from Eight Mile Ranch. They were able to assemble a world-class team of wranglers that came to participate on this project specifically for the opportunity to work with them. I can't even imagine undertaking the logistics of this without their help. Los Angeles is an inevitable city. The climate is perfect. We live on this uh, vast plain next to the ocean. We have some of the best weather in the world. Around the turn of the century, there was a tremendous migration into Southern California. People came here for the good air to breathe. And the population expanded. And to meet those population demands, Los Angeles started looking for places to import water into the city. And so Mr. Mulholland and Fred Eaton, who was then mayor, traveled to the Owens Valley to look for water supply to bring into Los Angeles. They procured water rights throughout the Eastern Sierra and then slowly went to the voters of the city to try to find the funding to build what then became the Los Angeles Aqueduct, which was opened in 1913. We developed a first-hand experience of what some of the early explorations of the West might have been like when people like Powell were commissioned by the U.S. government to explore the entire West and came up with incredible maps that are as valid today as they were then about how the West could be divided if we didn't make an L.A. aqueduct or a Hoover Dam. What would the West look like if we learned to live within the rivers and streams that fall from the Rockies and the Sierras, where would civilization be? Well, we'll be there in a few minutes, huh? Uh, can you see me here? I saw you a minute ago, now I'm kind of in a low spot. I'm gonna be down below the aqueduct crossing. Um, how similar is it to the um, bridge at um, Black Rock going to the pool field? It's got more dirt on top of it. I just got a confirmation. They should be right there um, momentarily. If they're not there already. We're about five minutes out, maybe less. Okay. Do you see CHP or can you from where you're at? There's a CHP. There's two of them. That. Ron's gonna inch it up a notch. Say again. I think one notch would be perfect. I think our logistics team, as in Jaime and Jennifer, get major, major kudos on the time travel estimation for today. Oh, well, thank you. And I will say, if it wasn't for Jaime's technical Google Earth skills, we still wouldn't have those estimations. Way to go.
we're living in a time where there's a whole lot of assumptions we make by living in a city like Los Angeles. We assume there will be enough water somehow. We assume there'll be enough food somehow. We assume there'll be enough power somehow. And I think people are starting to feel, is that a reasonable assumption to make? I'm not satisfied with just making the artwork. I'm more interested in the environmental aspects of it that need to go past the artwork into affecting how we live in our watershed, which comes back to the statement that artists must create on the same scale that society has the capacity to destroy. flown over the Owens Valley myself a few times in my flights over that part of Los Angeles and beyond. And so I was familiar with the general landscape, but I was so fascinated to see what Lauren was doing there and how she had made an investment in thinking about her project and her actions over the last years. surprising image, mules, <laughs> and a hundred of them, <laughs> all labeled with the hundred blankets, and a fantastic sight. Right under the wing. <laughs> they look so cool. They oh, really yeah. do. They look so beautiful. Great. So great. We had a chance actually to see the line of the mules with the shadows from the air, and it was very beautiful. So Lauren, as an artist, I think really understands how to make an image, something that draws the line, draws attention for focus for a project which is really very multifaceted, very complex, very embedded in the community, very thoughtful about large issues of water and time and Los Angeles and the Owens Valley. So I think what was nice was this line she drew, an image she made, as a way to get us into the complexity of the issues. What an artist does is takes something like the idea of the Western and reconsiders it entirely, right? Takes a different perspective toward it. You know, it is a Western, it's a journey. <laughs> It's a road movie, perhaps, to the extent that it's filmed and documented this walk of the mules from the Owens Valley to Los Angeles. There isn't a tradition of art that has developed in the Western United States that is to make art that isn't a picture of nature, as might be a 19th century romantic sense of how to bring nature into the world of art, but rather channels nature, space, 
into experience. She's working in a tradition of artists that have existed here in the West, the Western United States, in these large spaces. It causes you to think differently, as I think it caused um, settlers to think differently and caused Mulholland to think differently. So she's neither celebrating nor really denigrating the anniversary. What she's doing is bringing awareness. And I think that's what's very exciting about her work as an artist, is that it's not just about making images for a gallery or a museum, but it's about engaging communities, thinking about our world, and thinking about making our world better by both actions and creating an insight through an image into the truth of history. For great cities to exist, you need water. Rome imports close to 90% of its water. New York City imports 100% of its water from hundreds of miles away to be their drinking water. San Francisco imports 99% of its water in order for that great city to survive. So it was inevitable, like every other great city, that we would import water into Los Angeles to help it grow. The second section went from Olancha to Mojave. And that section of road was quite an opportunity to deal with endurance. It was very hot, very long days, really adventuresome. We were up in the mountains. We were where the big siphons are, where the water comes all the way down and then jets all the way up. The one thing that I feel is a tremendous loss, and Los Angeles needs to acknowledge it, is our indebtedness to places such as Owens Valley, to the area of Mono County, where we import our water into the city. Those are the sources of where our water comes from, and we need to recognize that, and we need to recognize that we have this debt. And that that debt can be expressed through acting responsibly and how we use water here in Los Angeles and how we capture that water from these various sources. We have to do it responsibly and I think that's the message that, that Lauren is conveying is that we have this relationship with these places hundreds of miles away. We are connected and she connected Owens Valley with Los Angeles in this incredibly creative way of using the very muscle, the means of building that aqueduct in the first place as a means of telling the story a hundred years later. That's the cemetery, I think. That's the old post office. Then we'll be alongside Paved Road until we get to the aqueduct. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to kind of stay to the left there. The one thing that might be worth looking at is, is that railroad crossing. Oh, we better look at that. Yeah? Yeah. This right here. All right, let's see that. Uh -huh. The third section of the walk was through the Mojave Desert, from Mojave straight to the San Fernando Valley. That was so surreal. We went through the territory of what I call like the giant forest of wind instruments. 
camped out at night with the buzz of high tension cables overhead, energy being transmitted from the deserts around us. That whole stretch, which is about a week of walking, is really rich in terms of the territory of exploration of solar and wind energy. We're trying to move into a new era with other kinds of energy sources, but the last century has largely been underpinned by water from the Sierras and the Rockies. So I would say that that third week discussion was about the energy part of the water and power equation. to the track when you get here? If I'm in front, I'll ride right across and encourage whatever I'm new on riding not to even hesitate. And not get the others thinking. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, no, this won't be a problem. I mean, we may need some little help, like the bridge for some of the younger ones, but we'll see. Yeah. I think we're in good shape. When we were in Mojave, we also had the opportunity to see time suspended in another interesting way, and that is how do we move goods around the world? Because the mule for a really long time moved our goods around the United States. But certainly since the mid-century, the unit of trade has shifted in the global economy to the cargo container. So to see the mule and the train with the cargo container adjacent in Mojave is a really unique thing.
Finally, the fourth section was the San Fernando Valley. We actually made it by November 5th to the Cascades, where the Department of Water and Power was doing a reenactment of the event that happened 100 years ago when William Mulholland did his famous speech, There It Is, Take It, and water was delivered to the throngs of people waiting to see that waterfall enter the San Fernando Valley.
so the logistics of this metabolic sculpture, the, the logistics of drawing the line, the experience we all had of moving through space together was the most perfect social experiment I've ever participated in. We all felt the meaning behind what we were doing, so the whole experience was infused with direct action that private citizens are so uniquely capable of doing. But when we do it collectively, it builds a very special energy that I would like to have more of in my life and in my philanthropy. That image of the mules walking the skyline of Los Angeles with the city in the background was the image that galvanized for me as an artist. That was the image I wanted to, to see. That was the image that was in my mind's eye. Because the mule and the horse relate to a different moment in history than the skyscrapers that you see through that haze. And I remember saying, look, if we only get one image from the whole trip, it's that image. There's theoretical problems that are bigger <laughs> than things that I can do. I, I can't personally figure out what the next hundred years are going to look at, but I can use that round number of 100 to draw a line in the sand and say, I as a private citizen and as an artist need to create a paradigm shift. It's about acknowledging that there's been a very high price tag paid for the lifestyle that we enjoy today. And it's not simply about the water we have, it's about the power we use. Because most of our power comes from the same water. It's all about falling water and gravity. I don't believe that today we can look at a time when we're not going to need water from the Sierras, but we can certainly, as a society, do a lot better at managing that resource and utilizing it again and again and again. So to end a 100 mule walk, how can you possibly do something big enough or cathartic enough and I said, you've got to trust the mules. Unburden them of their load, their bridle, their reins, their bit, their pads, and just let them be. You know, when I think about the West, I think about stampeding herds of buffalo and what that must have been like, you know? Can you imagine to even have 100 of those? I mean, this is pure, unbridled energy. That for me is the Western, you know, that's the exported fantasy of why I live in Los Angeles, why we make art here in Los Angeles. Is that this is still the Wild West in terms of the world of culture. We're still capable of thinking of ourselves as mavericks running wild and free on this landscape. And the question is, where do we decide how to control that kind of combustive life force.